So Tanu and Jessica, I wanted to start with both of you. Um, many of the participants in this webinar think specifically about working with immigrants and refugees in the context of integration. How can the intersection between environmentalism or economic equity show us that bigger global picture of immigration and what are the benefits of that bigger global picture for the public consciousness? Tanu, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. And thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's so important to be thinking about the intersections, particularly of the climate crisis and migration right now. Uh, the reality is uh, these are some of the biggest um, issues of our time. And uh, those uh, communities who've had the least to do with the climate crisis are the ones who are impacted and therefore are the ones who are uh, forced to migrate from their homelands. And as a contemporary example, I don't know if any of you know this, but there's this massive cyclone that's about to hit Bangladesh and India in the next 36 hours. And uh, these are communities who are currently facing the pandemic and also are now facing this epic um, storm. And what, what, what we're sort of faced with this uh, compound crisis right now of the pandemic and the climate crisis that is forcing people out of their homes. And it's oftentimes people who are low income and poor, people of color, folks from the global south who are the most impacted. Um, and to give you a sense of just like the, st the statistics, it's estimated by um, the UN, by uh, the Migration Policy Institute at the UN that um, by 2050, there will be close to a billion people m migrating because of climate reasons, whether it's drought, whether it's being uh, pushed out of their homes. And um, this really connects to the ways in which uh, immigrants are welcomed and not welcomed, right? Um, we are seeing the rise of xenophobia. We are seeing countries really lock down their borders. And um, that's really going to impact the ability for uh, m migrants who are forced because of the climate crisis to seek refuge. And so um, I've been, because I used, worked in the immigrant rights movement and now work in the climate movement, I'm pretty invested in making sure that we're making these connections because the reality is that those most impacted by the climate crisis are people from the global south, are, are people seeking refuge. If you, for example, even... Um, look at the refugee crisis on the southern border of the U.S. A lot of those um, migrants and, and refugees from parts of Central America, what you won't hear in the media is that it's oftentimes a compound crisis. It's not just like corruption in Nicaragua or Central America. It's also the complex um, set of factors, including the climate crisis. Uh, that whole area of Central America is a drought corridor and has been severely impacted by climate. And so um, a lot of those migrants are also leaving because they're not able to grow their crops anymore. Um, their farmland has been devastated. But one of the things that's interesting is that if one, when they seek to come to the U.S., when they're at the U.S.-Mexico uh, southern border, uh, it is not a, um, they can't, like, if, if they say that they're migrating and seeking refugee status because of the climate crisis, that's not a basis for them to get refugee status in the United States. And so we also have the, the issue of the fact that a lot of um, immigration policies in lots of different countries, whether it's the US and other places, are not actually up to date and do not take into account the climate crisis and how the climate cli crisis are impacting migrants. And so for me, when I think about the intersections of climate and migration, um, with all of the other issues that have been talked about, I also think a lot about what does it mean to um, to push forward just climate policy, just immigration policy that's connected? And how do we really think about all of this within the frame of inequity? And given the current situation that we're in, what does a just recovery look like that al allows for communities to stay in their homes if they want to? Because a lot of folks actually don't really want to move, they're forced. And also, how do we make sure that people have the right to migrate no matter what? Exactly. And um, Jessica, that more complex picture. What is the benefit of that for, for the public? Sure, thank you. Um, well, Tanu spoke about the sort of global lens and I wanna also bring it into a domestic lens of immigrant integration from a place-based perspective and thinking about how um, immigrants, individuals, families, and entire communities become part of the, not just the fabric of our communities and society, but part of the economy. And so and from an economic um, wealth building perspective and you know wealth inequity perspective um i want to i want to just invite people <laughs> to think about the way we the way we think about um 
poverty right now, especially in the context of this global pandemic, the reasons why we have poverty in this country here in the United States and potentially globally, right? And the underlying root causes, um, going back to some of the things that Kirsten Dursey spoke about from a public health perspective, those upstream causes of poverty and inequality today are the same structures that actually structure opportunity for newcomers when they arrive and for longstanding community members in our cities, in our towns across the country. So the immigrant integration lens I've always found incredibly um, beneficial from a communal perspective, moving from an individualistic perspective, looking at communities. Immigrant integration is about people, newcomers and longstanding community members adapting and changing and creating new ways of you know, structuring the economy, our health systems, our other systems, so that all people can thrive. Now, the thing I'll say about the benefits for these shifts to all Americans, um, if we really believe that you can sort of escape poverty and get ahead by working hard and saving in a bank account, which is the narrative and that's kind of how anti-poverty policy is designed in the United States, then it's harmful for all of us. We internalize that belief. We all, those of us who have resources think we have them because we worked hard. Those of us who don't have resources think we need to work harder. There's also a racialized component to this where, you know, the racial wealth gap in this country is so vast that we're looking at, you know, just for example, in Boston, $8 of median wealth for um, African American Bostonians versus over 250000 in median household wealth for white Bostonians. So we're talking about vast, vast inequities that are exposed also by COVID and perpetuated by poverty. Um, I recently read that in 23 days after COVID started, um, the wealth for billionaires in this country rose by $282 billion. So that is the level of inequality we're talking about. Meanwhile, we have 26 million people filing for unemployment. And so, you know, I think speaking to the choir in terms of these structural underlying um, policies and, you know, the way our economy is set up, what is really vital right now in this moment of recovery and resistance and moving forward is to understand what are the actual causes of poverty and inequality and how can we shift those instead of putting um, increasing blame on individuals. We need to look at it from a communal perspective, turn strangers into neighbors and, you know, kind of work together to reshift how we want our communities to allocate resources. So David, how did you do that shift in your community? Um, tell us about, tell attendees, uh, what should, how best should faith organizations deal with this? Yeah, I go back to the stranger to neighbor model. I, we found that for most people who I think somebody named earlier as being just kind of neutral on this issue and not really willing to speak out on it a, a, a whole lot to really build the kind of structural justice that, that a lot of the panelists are speaking to, it starts with, with, with education and again, some non-biased, reliable facts. But again, we found that that has to be followed up with personal relationships to their newest neighbors who may be uh, facing injustice. And we found that once the issue becomes personal, people will take action. People don't generally take action until things become personal and they have a personal relationship to it. That's why it has to be both the education and the relationship. Um, and we also would say for those that are not there yet, not as evolved as we want to be in their thinking, at Faith Action, we're not big believers in the name and shame game. We found that when that happens, those people, you can kiss them goodbye forever being an ally. Um, they, it takes a while for them to evolve. And that's the big existential crisis here because unnecessary suffering is happening at a hair's pace. And how long it takes neutral people to evolve happens at a snail's pace. And I think within the immigrant rights movement as a whole, both the integration folks and the rights folks have to realize that they're part of the same puzzle. But instead, I oftentimes find them 
naming and shaming one another. But rather, I think immigrant rights folks need to be, and activists need to be pushing, pushing and pushing and creating a vision for what the future could be, but also understand that there has to be some evolution for other members of our society to get there. And we found with education and personal relationship, beautiful things are happening in that. And that's not just a vision. We've seen that happen in Greensboro. We've been around for 20 years and this ID card program is one beautiful example. And it's not just happening in a place like Greensboro. It's happening in Morganton in, in a lot of small towns that you wouldn't expect are liberal bastions of immigrant rights. Uh, but it's because strangers have become neighbors, not because they've been pushed with one political view or another. So um, I hope that's helpful. Right. Um, how does that education and relationship building work? Uh, Amitesh and Tanu, maybe you can give some examples of uh, an organization or a person or a thing that uh, you had to build relationships with to become an, to ally, uh, align goals. You, you mean like between between movements? Correct. Cool. Between yeah. Between movements or just getting another organization on board with what you're doing. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I'll just speak from my personal experience. So when I came to 350.org, I was really clear that a lot of my interests were actually in the intersections of uh, immigration and climate. Uh, I don't come from the environmental movement. I don't come from the climate movement. And I think that that was, uh, really showed a significant shift in the ways in which and an, a climate organization like at 350 was thinking about like who actually should be coming into this space. Um, and so I'm seeing um, more folks in the climate movement really be thinking about the interconnections between um, climate and migration. So some of our um, or organizations that we work with and, um, you know, uplift in the immigrant rights space are organizations like United We Dream, like Mi Gente, um, a lot of organizations doing work on the border. Um, we also um, do a lot of political education of our base, um, which, um, you know, to be frank, are a lot of older uh, white folks who are interested in climate. And I think that we have um, a, a real obligation to make sure that we're connecting these issues because, um, you know, when we talk to, we, when we push to, you know, solve the climate crisis or phase out fossil fuels, we actually need to think about it in the larger context of equity and justice. When we talk about demanding a Green New Deal, and right now there's a lot of work around demanding a global Green New Deal coming out of this pandemic with a, a long-term climate resilient model for just recovery. We can't ignore migrants and these things can't happen in silos. And so a lot of this work is around building um, cross movement coalitions that can break down those silos to make sure that we are uh, moving forward progressive issues together. Amitesh, building those cross sectoral uh, coalitions, what has that been like? Well, honestly, like, you know, and this might be a little controversial, uh, but, you know, it, it, in, at least in the past few decades, the queer rights movement has indirectly or directly always kind of benefited immigrants' rights. Uh, take it, like, you know, from marriage equality to, like, you know, removing homosexuality being listed as a, uh, as a mental affliction, excuse me, what's it called? A constitutional psychopathic inferiority. You know, it's like getting all of that removed from the laws has been, like, due to a huge push of the queer rights movement. And that is, at least indirectly, but also very directly, kind of, uh, like, impacted the rights of queer immigrants. Uh, but I completely agree with everything that all the other panelists are saying, you know, that it is so important to like kind of build these relationships, like build kind of uh, like this, um, excuse me, I believe the, the term used was like cross functional, uh, excuse me, I forgot, I forgot the term you used, Tanu, but basically like, you know, um, like kind of having an organ, like building relationships basically across movements basically intersectionalities, right? Like, and there are many organizations that do do that. If you look at, like, you know, Make the Road New York, they work in criminal justice rights as well as immigrant, like, as well as immigrant rights, as well as, like, you know, the way that they overlap with each other. And honestly, like, more and more organizations are, like, seeing the importance of doing this. And it is honestly becoming increasingly, uh, it's, it's, it's actually becoming increasingly apparent that this is exactly what we need to do. And I believe that we are actually moving towards that right now. Jessica, empowerment economics. Could you briefly tell us what that means? Briefly. Yes. And, um, tell us the stakeholders who need to be involved in that and maybe building on what David and Tammy was saying about educating others, um, making sure that they see their vested interest. Sure. Is, is that how you go about getting this inter intersectionality? 
Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to share one slide and note that we have some resources to share later for attendees. But basically, you know, building off what I was saying before about inequities, the underlying structural inequities that shape our society. I've been working in partnership with um, Hawaiian Community Assets and National Capacity, um, API communities and local leaders in place based in a place based model for the last couple of years to look at solutions. How are people really addressing these long standing inequities in their community. And so the term empowerment economics refers to an alternative to the anti poverty policies that we see that kind of blame the individual and say people just need to save and instead it's a multi-generational and a culturally responsive and culturally rooted approach to building wealth but also power and so often we talk about you know kind of resources and economics in one in one space we talk about immigrant integration or immigration rights in a, in a different space. And I love the overarching message of this webinar, you know, climate justice is here, everything else is here. And empowerment economics is really a holistic way of looking at um, a society or a community. So I would love to encourage everyone on this webinar to take the big ideas, and there's so many ideas that have been shared today, and really pull them in to a local perspective, you know, you're literally your neighbors and your communities and think about how to create economic and financial well-being that is really just holistically about well-being in general and well-being of communities. So empowerment economics is, is a model. It's a, it's a practice. And it's also um, a response to the fact that in our, you know, historically, we shouldn't be surprised that we're seeing the levels of inequality that we see today. We shouldn't actually be surprised that we're seeing um, the disparities in the, you know, the health disparities as well as economic disparities that are coming out of this global pandemic. If we all understand how our society is structured, this is exactly what we would expect to see, right? These in inequities today. So we need to re reshape <laughs> the underlying ways that we connect in communities um, and empower everyone to understand those underlying structural inequities. So that's part of it, right? The narrative shift, but also to act. And so that's where um, I appreciate, Tano, you talking about really education, but also political education, really building power. Um, empowerment economics is about building that power alongside resources. So redistributing power and wealth, really. Um, redistributing that so, 282 billion. Jessica, who needs to be in that, and Tanu, who needs to be in that conversation? I actually think that, you know, communities of color need to be leading, structuring, um, completely deciding whether that conversation needs to be happening or what the conversation is. And so I've been really honored to be a partner from a research perspective and a, you know, kind of a strategic perspective with certain organizations. But um, I'll just say that communities not, not being centered, just at the center. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll just echo that. I think that when we talk about the kind of shifts like in policy that we need that really bring together all of our movements, we need to center those who are most impacted. And those who are most impacted are black, brown, indigenous and migrant people and low income people. And so when we think about like the kinds of solutions we need to the climate crisis, like we know that um, those most impacted by the climate crisis like have solutions. We also really look towards our, um, our indigenous partners who um, you know, have been working on these solutions for decades. Um, and so really sec is, um, centering those who um, have been um, the most impacted um, is, is, is critical. David, see, looking at this idea of power and imbalance, um, we see the, the imbalance of power between the, the privilege of having a documented status and not. Um, how does Faith Action's municipal ID program address this imbalance and describe how the difference in power between different groups of Im immigrants is an intersectional issue? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, we, we see, you know, about 80% of the people that we have the privilege of serving uh, each day do have limited or no status. About 20% um, do have status. And, and many of those that do have status um, may not fully be aware of that there is no line for those that don't have status to get into. And you really do see on a daily basis sometimes uh, immigrant 
some folks within the immigrant community calling others out because they themselves may not have a full understanding that, that other immigrants never had a line that they did or they may have not come from means or uh, whatever it might have been. Uh, with our ID card program, it's part of why we, we frame it as being for all people, not just for the immigrant community, but for uh, anybody who may be a, a, a citizen, anybody who may uh, have no documents at all. It, it really doesn't matter. And we don't privilege anybody uh, within, uh, you know, uh, how we, we structure that program whatsoever. Uh, we rather just lift up the, the tremendous gifts that all of us have to, to offer, have a better shared understanding of some of the inequities in our immigration system within social justice, within economics, and really try to bring folks together uh, to, to really create a, a, a greater sense of understanding and then basically uh, move forward together. And I agree with all the thoughts around making sure that people who are most affected, their, their vision, their voices are, are first, uh, first and foremost. Um, but we really have had to do sometimes just as much education with immigrants who may have status as we have, you know, people who were born in this country around some of these inequities. And it really has been the same process of, of education um, and relationships to break a lot of that down. So, and in just a quick note, our program is not a municipal ID. It's a, it's a community ID program. And part of what makes it intersectional is that law enforcement, health service schools, they don't have to accept the ID. They choose to accept the ID. And for the newcomer community, saying you accept my ID is almost like a sign to say you accept me. And that includes the community theater. It includes the children's museum. And that's huge first step to building upon. Uh, it's a huge first step for greater things to happen in all the ways the other panelists are talking about. So. Tanu, I was wondering, you know, Irish famine, earthquakes in Haiti, hurricanes in Central America, the connection between environmentalism and migration policy seems so obvious, yet I guess in, in public perception, but maybe also in, in certain immigrant rights movements, uh, certain areas, they don't, they, they don't see this. What have you done to sort of rectify this and what, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, you know, more and more, a lot of these um, climate impacts are, I'd, I'd call them unnatural <laughs> disasters. They're actually um, because of uh, what big oil has done for decades, which is to deceive the public around climate change. Um, you know, I, I think for me, I, I'm not a scientist, I'm an advocate. And, um, you know, I, I think sometimes people get like overwhelmed by the science of climate change when it comes to like emissions and CO2. But like when we think about like the impact on people, again, what this means is that you know, people are forced from their homes, people are unable to grow crops, people, uh, people's livelihoods are impacted. And again, it's m mainly folks in the global south who are impacted. Um, but, but, you know, even when we think about the United States, there's a great article in The Guardian that I'll put in the chat later. But, um, you know, the long term impacts of the climate crisis are that people are going to have to migrate from coastal cities like New York, like Miami, more inland. And, uh, you know, we already saw that with like Hurricane Katrina. And we saw the devastating, inequitable impacts on black communities in um, in New Orleans when um, Houston was hit by um, a hurricane a couple of years ago, undocumented communities in Houston, half a million undocumented people got no access to FEMA. And so even when there's a climate impact, we see the ways in which immigrant uh, communities are impacted inequitably. Uh, when the wildfires happened in California, undocumented communities in California were not given the same kinds of support that um, you know, U.S. citizens and, um, you know, others were given. And again, we're seeing that in the pandemic, right, with the stimulus. Like, the stimulus money isn't going to, to, to immigrants without immigration status. And so uh, there are all of these connections. And I, I think that it's really important when we, to, to really um, actually kind of stop using the term natural disaster. These are not natural. Um, and to really make sure that uh, we're thinking about the broader connection. So, I mean, in, in, the, in the immigration work that I've done, a lot of the ways in which I used to um, do work around uh, immigrants impacted by um, some sort of like crisis, whether it was like an earthquake or a hurricane, was through temporary protected status, right? So TPS is the only kind of um, mechanism in the U.S. that um, can, you know, uh, help people to stay 
at least on a temporary basis um, to um, a away from harm that's happening in their own communities. But already we're seeing the Trump administration trying to strip TPS. They're trying to strip, strip TPS of Haitians, of Central Americans, of people from West Africa. And so again, we don't have a longer term policy framework to really think about um, the impacts of the climate crisis. And, you know, like, I, I brought up the um, this uh, hurricane or cyclone that's going Im to uh, impact Bangladesh in the next couple of days. Bangladesh is a very low-lying region that's already being impacted by rising sea levels. And so again, here we see the impact of the climate crisis um, and what that's going to do in terms of potential migration in the South Asian region. And, um, you know, this summer, like, we're, we're facing, again, a compound crisis of the pandemic. And um, we know that hurricane season is about to start. What does that mean for our communities across the U.S.? And so um, I, I really think, encourage all of us to really think about all of these issues um, in connection to each other, like even in, to bring in the LGBTQ um, uh, connection here. You know, there's a lot of... Um, you know, trans migrants, for example, at the border who are not being um, let into the U.S., who are like put in particular conditions in detention centers. I just say that these are all connected and we need to be talking about them together. Thank you for that great perspective. We have some great questions from attendees, and one of them is from Brian. Uh, we tried to address several different social justice issues. We weren't able to address all of them, but he wants to know how do we infuse accessibility and ability as yet another intersectional aspect of immigration among all of the systems of oppression impacting individuals. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Infusing accessibility and ability as yet another intersectional aspect of immigration. I mean, I have a thought that relates to the overall perspective that this webinar takes on, you know, I hear us all saying we need to work together and it can be overwhelming to have this menu of, you know, kind of, sectors or advocacy areas um, and think about how do we collaborate. But if we step back, the, it's artificial that they are separate in the first place, right? And so, um, and speaking directly about ability status and disabilities, if you, if you think about, I, I think one of the original worst insults of colonization was to separate people from land and people from each other in different categories and and decolonizing this process of you know kind of advocacy and immigrant integration and repairing resisting current structures of oppression but also repairing them and creating new new structures involves um, you know, kind of resisting those different categories and figuring out how to align our work under bigger umbrellas. I don't know, I don't exactly have the answer, but I do see from a place-based perspective how that can work um, at a community level. If, if people are really looking at how do we want our community to operate and care for each other, that's an inclusive way that can, you know, break down some of those barriers. David, we have a question for you. Uh, Els would love to, Els, which I, you may know, uh, would love to hear about how intersecting, intersectional organizing helped your organization address the anti-immigrant state uh, policies and positions, including related to the ID card program he discussed. Yeah, so we were uh, several years ahead of the, uh, the current administration on banning sanctuary cities uh, as a state. Um, they kind of got overshadowed by the bathroom law in North Carolina. You may remember that from, from five or six years ago. And as a part of that banning sanctuary cities, they also took a real shot at our ID card program and saying we're no longer going to allow any judge, clerk, magistrate, government official, or law enforcement to be able to accept a community ID card. Uh, and essentially, law enforcement, the 24 agencies that were now accepting this card, st stood up to what in this particular case was a majority Republican uh, legislation and said, you kill this card and our ability to accept it, you will have killed three years worth of trust building with this community um, that has truly led to safer communities. And we have some of the facts and figures and testimonies for our police chiefs to back it up. And they listened there. You also had health, uh, health officials, uh, teachers all standing up, speaking up against the broader anti-sanctuary law. And while unfortunately that passed, they at least amended the community ID bill for at least law enforcement to still be able to accept it. And then health center schools, businesses still could as well. And ironically, that's when the program actually flourished in, in dozens of other communities. Um, before that, it wasn't known as well. So it was really 
uh, nice to see law enforcement stand up in that particular case, um, including a lot of immigrant officers who came from a tough background as it relates to the immigration experience. And um, again, I know this is a touchy issue uh, right now around law enforcement and, and immigrants, but there, I think there have been a few stories where it's done well and it's done right that, that could be shared elsewhere. Um, and that's, that's one of them because law enforcement doesn't usually speak out like that in those circumstances. So that was a, that was a win for us, even if the bill still still passed. Thank you for that, Reverend David. Um, and before we wrap up, we have a question from Kirsten, who would want to hear maybe just, we only have maybe a minute or so left. Uh, ideas for bringing more discussion and work and knowledge about economic and climate justice to public health as a public health issue of concern. Yeah, absolutely. Climate is a public health issue. I mean, we are living it right now. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the reasons why I like working in climate is that like it, climate is an umbrella issue to me. Um, it is something that impacts LGBTQ people. It impacts um, migrants. It, it, you know, it, it impacts all of us. And there's ways in which we're all we're all connected to it. And so um, when it, I, I think that sometimes cli the climate the climate crisis gets like really overwhelming for people because people are like, well, what do I, what can I actually do about it? And I think it is actually important to break it down in terms of like, what are the local impacts? And like public health is a huge impact. Um, you know, I, there is actually a real connection between climate and environmental justice. And, um, you know, for example, again, around the pandemic, it's, it's all connected that, for example, places like the Bronx or Queens, I live in New York, um, that are uh, the most impacted by the pandemic also have the highest rates of asthma. Um, and so uh, that's impacting who's getting sick from um, the pandemic, um, you know, because of uh, pollution, um, toxic oil and gas, uh, people, people's communities are being um, impacted. And so uh, I, I think the public health angle on climate is a really um, important way to bring people in to work on the climate crisis. Jessica, you want to add that quickly? Sure, just briefly, I would say, you know, we, we know that economic factors, wealth, income, et cetera, are a, you know, a social and structural determinant of health. And I think from a more practical policy perspective, there are areas where, you know, like financial stress really has been linked to um, both mental and physical health outcomes. And so creating communities and and ensuring that families less individuals but families and communities collective way of thinking have enough resources um, it's a survival question at this point right now in our communities um, and then it's it's less about mobility now it's more about survival and kind of um, minimum basic needs what what are the what is the floor that we are ensuring in our communities that we will not allow people to fall below i think that's a that's a public health question. <laughs> it's an economic question, and it's a um, it's a question for all of us. And where can we leverage some policy resources to create that floor? Um, make sure people have access to insurance, care, but also food, etc. Thank you very much for that. And I want to thank all of you for being of uh, making yourself available for this discussion, this conversation. Uh, Tanu, Jessica, David, Amitesh. I'd like um, Amitesh to close us off with maybe his one tip that everyone can do to ensure that they're incorporating intersectional thinking into their day-to-day -day work, what would it be? Sure, also uh, apologies, my internet got disconnected and had to reconnect it manually. Um, so the one tip I would say is that, you know, always consider that a person may have multiple identities. This, they, this is, in, like, I work in direct client services, but, and it's, 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 it's really easy to silo that, okay, I'm working on an immigration case right now, let me just focus on the immigration and ignore everything else that's surrounding the client. It's really, really, really important to just see the client as a person and see how they experience the world in order to help them best. 